I will now call 125-552 in the matter of the wrongful conviction of Damien Bumgarner. May it please the court, counsel. Larry Michael of Kennedy Berkeley and Salina representing the appellant Damien Baumgarner. Your Honor, may I have three minutes for rebuttal? Three minutes is granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Unfortunately, over a number of years, our culture and our society figured out that a number of people were, for various reasons, being sent to uh, prison or incarceration that had not committed the crime that they were convicted of. To attempt to provide some form of remedy for this wrong, the Kansas legislature in 2018 enacted the Kansas wrongful conviction statute, which provides a remedy for people that can show that they were wrongfully convicted of a felony crime. In this case, Damian Baumgarner, I believe it's uncontroverted that he meets all the elements under the statute, except the one thing that the district court uh, dismissed the case on was a finding that he had not been imprisoned because he was held in the Sumner County Jail instead of facilities operated by the Kansas Department of Corrections. So the issue in this case for you is under the statute, what does the word imprisonment mean? And ironically- Can you clarify for me, what was the duration of his entire confinement? That's just not called, wasn't as, it less than a year? As, as I was told, I, I, I came up with 10 months, but am I wrong? No, that's correct, Your Honor. What happened was- the underlying sentence for unlawful possession of a firearm, he was sentenced to 60 day, days right. in jail. That also constituted a violation of uh, his probation in another case that added on another six months. Thank, thank you. That's why I you're, just you're wanted, wanted to Honor. verify that. Thank but you. isn't the legal question here just um, whether he was... Um, in custody of the state as opposed to some other correctional? Uh... Well, there's two aspects to that question, Your Honor. The first thing I would say is he was in some form of uh, in custody of the state because he did receive a KDOC number and he does have a KDOC record as a result. But more importantly, Your Honor, the statute does not specify who you need to be in the custody of. And in fact, the irony is, is this court has specifically and strongly addressed the issue of the interpretation of this word. Uh, in 2002 in State v. Huff, the court said there can be no doubt that confinement in a county jail constitutes imprisonment. Based on that language, there's absolutely no argument that what happened to Mr. Baumgartner constitutes imprisonment without this court reversing several of its prior holdings, not just State v. Huff, but also State v. Walbridge. And the, well, it wouldn't require reversing those those holdings, would it? They, those cases didn't have to do with this particular act. It didn't have to do with this specific statute, but if you're going to rewrite the definition of imprisonment, I... Well, I agree with you that the definition is what's at issue here. And, right. and certainly you have read from our case law um, authority that is supportive of your proposed definition. But of course, there's authority on the other side too, which I suppose is what we're here to argue about. Well... Um, so what would you, how would you respond to the state's argument that, look, your the those Supreme Court cases are are well and good in their context, but the we have a, the sentencing guideline statute, which clearly defines imprisonment as being quote in a facility operated by KDOC. Well, again, you have to look at the specific statutory scheme you're looking at. The statute that the state primarily relies on very specifically contains the definition, but it also says it's specifically limited to that statutory uh, act. 
in ASA 21608 at all. So we have two conflicting definitions, neither of which is directly on point. How do we decide between them? Because which one makes more sense? First off, the one that I'm arguing complies with the vast majority of legal interpretation. Not only is this case, or I'm sorry, this court ruled that uh, in, in imprisonment and a county facility is imprisonment. But if you look at the definitions and the legal uh, dictionaries that were attached to our brief, it's pretty much universal that imprisonment is generally defined as any type of confinement. In fact, in Huff, this court said imprisonment and confinement are one and the same and may be used interchangeably. So when you look at the statute, unless there is a specific variation from that definition, the rules of interpretation would suggest we ought to use the common meaning of words. And in the common meaning of the word imprisonment, we do not limit it to confinement in a state facility. So your argument is that um, the plain language of this statute produces a result which which is the result you're arguing for, that confinement in the jail qualifies as imprisonment. Absolutely, Your Honor. If you're not arguing for an ambiguity in the statute. No, I don't believe it's ambiguous because I think that this court has made clear what the word means. If the legislature, when drafting the statute, had looked in a legal dictionary, they would have come to the conclusion that uh, imprisonment would include being held in a county jail. Just in terms of the facts, I wanted to ask a clarifying question. My understanding of the record, um, but correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's it's clear, there's no dispute that your client was sentenced to probation with the statutory 60-day jail time as a condition of probation. And the statute states that those 60 days are to be served in the custody of the of community corrections. Is that what happened here? Yes. We all that's, agree. That's my understanding. Your and Honor. we also know that the statutes make it clear that when an individual is in the custody of community corrections, they are not in the custody of the Secretary of Corrections. That's correct, Your Honor. So at least factually, we we all can agree we know what happened. He was given probation as a sentence. The statute provides that when you're given probation after a felony conviction, the court can order 60 days in jail as a, quote, condition of probation. And that's what happened. Exactly. And, and Your Honor, also, I think what's important, two well, things I'd like to add on to what I said before. One is, not only in the criminal context, but in the civil context, we have a common understanding of what imprisonment is. Uh, false imprisonment, civil context, very rarely involves somebody actually in prison. It's usually somebody being held in the trunk of a car, being held in a basement, being held against their will. We universally have an interpretation of what imprisonment means, and it is not limited to confinement in a federal facility, or I'm sorry, state facility. The other thing your, Your Honor, um, Judge Stigel, that I would say is we also need to look at the purpose of the statute, which is why I started out the way I did. I think there's no argument here that Mr. Baumgartner was held in a cell for eight months wrongfully. He, he, was, he had not committed a felony as a matter of law as determined by the Kansas Court of Appeals. And if he wouldn't have been convicted of that felony, he would not have spent one day, additional day anyway, in a cell. And we talk about a cell, but really we're talking about a cage. And I think that sometimes it's easy to remove ourselves from what the effect of that does to people. Um, I have a close relative uh, that when I was younger, had to spend a year at Learned State Hospital. I, he's 86 years old, and I doubt that there's been a day of his life he hasn't thought at least once about that year that he was away from his family. He was confined. 
And Let me ask you a question. I do notice, and I don't know whether this makes a difference to your argument, but since you're talking about the purpose of the statute, when you are looking at 60-5004G, um, and G is the part, we're not talking about any money at this point, okay? The damages are under E. But if the claimant is entitled to judgment, it is only then that he can get or she a certificate of innocence. Is there any other way besides this statute to get a certificate of innocence? Not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. This so is the fact that he, you know, spent this time in jail, you know, even if there were no damages at issue, he would be precluded from getting a certificate of innocence. That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Qualsap and I just, we have another case coming your way out of Sedgwick County where the district court in Sedgwick County awarded my client over $400,000 under this statute and the state is appealing that decision. I, you may find them being uh, disingenuous, but I'm not. That certificate of innocence was important, as important to my client as the money. He spent eight years in, in prison. And so I guess the point I'm trying to make here is I think for most people, the amount of time that you're held in that cell, that cage being confined, uh, you don't care where it's at. You don't care whether it's a state facility, a county facility, the state mental hospital, but you're confined away from your family. You're missing opportunities to spend with your kids. Let me ask uh, one other I question. Uh, just one other question. Sure. Um, so what do we do? Let's say that uh, a hypothetical that this happened, but the individual spent um, six months and one day in the custody of the KDOC. How would we interpret this statute, which gives damages by the year? Is there any precedent or anything for saying that it should be prorated or? This issue came up to some extent in our Sedgwick County case. And uh, Judge Calmer in that case basically just prorated it. It's, you know, if, you know, when we talk about interest, you know, post judgment interest is 10% per year. Well, that doesn't mean you have to have a judgment a year before you're entitled to interest. Whatever amount of time you have gets prorated based on that rate. And is, that, it, your, and is it your position also that you um, that piggybacking the probation revocation that was based on the commission of the felony also comes under this umbrella? And if so, what um, can you explain to me the legal analysis in that? But for the wrongful conviction, he would not have had to spend those six months. So the wrongful conviction resulted not only in a sentence in the underlying case, but it also caused a violation of another case, which resulted in further jail time. So, now, did you, do you believe that the statute is addresses that in any way, or is that something you want us to just, I mean, make make new law, I guess. Well, I don't think you need to make new law because I think that if you look at the statute, it doesn't directly say that the damages are limited solely to the, the crime for which the, un, the underlying sentence was imposed. It talks about time spent in jail. And I think the reality is a lot of people that would be possibly in this situation you could have other cases and, uh, you know, you could even go so far as to say, well, it's impacted by where you are on the sentencing grid. So there's a lot of things that impact the length of your sentence and the, the legislature enacting this statute didn't put any limits on well, that. Would you agree that those eight months or six months additional were not they were not time served on the wrongful conviction. Would you at least agree with that? I, I'm not trying to be disingenuous, Your Honor, but I honestly would take issue with that because but for right, you, the wrongful I, conviction. I understand your but for argument, and it makes sense. You're just saying, look, this is this wrongful conviction is what triggered the revocation in the prior case. 
but it would seem to me we could at least agree that the time served on the underlying prior case is not time served for the wrongful conviction. I mean, this is legally speaking, it's not. Right. right. And and if the court were to rule that way, then Mr. Baumgartner would still be entitled to prorated two months under that crime plus the certificate, certificate of innocence. innocence. Right. Can I ask you to clarify? I think maybe Justice Stiegel would ask you, and you sounded to me like you were conceding as a factual matter that uh, Mr. Baumgartner was not in the custody of the state. But at the opening, I thought you mentioned that there was evidence suggesting, even under your opposing counsel's interpretation of the statute, that there's at least a fact question as to whether DOC had custody because he was assigned a number. And that could be significant because I understand this was an issue decided on a motion to dismiss. Correct, Your Honor. Um, the the record in this case was confusing, and uh, my apologies, I've never practiced criminal law per se, so I'm not as familiar with a lot of the attorneys that appear before you on some of these niceties about sentencing and such, but when I initially was contacted by Mr. Baumgartner, I was under the mistaken understanding that he actually had been in state custody because I looked him up and he had the KDOC number and there was a reference to that conviction. It was only then after Mr. Qualseth got involved and, and clarified that no, he had actually been held in the uh, Sumner County Jail. So that's a long answer to your question, but I suppose, yes, that gets down to what does it mean to be in custody? I mean, he was under the jurisdiction, as I understand it, of the Kansas Department of Corrections. If he would have violated his probation on the underlying case, it's my understanding he very easily could have been back in, in a state facility. So it, it, I think you make a good point about how do you define exactly what custody means. But I don't think we even have to get there <laughs> Because I think the mere fact that he was confined satisfies the purpose and intent of the statute. Can I just ask a couple of procedural questions real quick? The, um, this You filed your petition and then the state filed a motion to dismiss, correct? correct. And then there were additional uh, affidavits attached to the pleadings in response to the motion to dismiss. So the legal standard that the district court applied would have been a summary judgment standard. Is that correct? You're correct about the affidavits, but it was my understanding the judge applied a motion to dismiss standard. But I, but I did that, that's caveat. How is that possible? That, I think that's the same. How is it possible if the district court is focused on what jail your client's in? That's a fact statement. Correct. And even if you guys stipulate to the facts, we're already in fact world. I mean, that doesn't seem like an appropriate application of motion to me. I, I guess the reason I considered a motion to dismiss is there was no, dis you know, we weren't allowed to do any discovery. The only additional information was the affidavit. Right. And, and we just have, we have, I mean, it's pretty standard case law to talk about when there are additional facts, affidavits that come in after a motion to dismiss is filed, we treat it like a motion for summary judgment, even right. though, yes, it's a it's a very preliminary one that happens before discovery. But that's the legal standard that we're under here, right? We're reviewing I, this district court decision as if it was a motion for decided on a motion for summary judgment. I, the problem I have with that is we really didn't do discovery. I, I think the only... But I guess that leads to my last follow-up, which is if we rule in your favor, and really the only issue before us is the proper statutory interpretation of the word imprisonment. And if we rule in your favor, your client wouldn't prevail in this case. That would just send it back down for litigation on all the other factors in the statute, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. The The statute contemplates a bench trial. 
but there are other, I mean, the state has other defenses, obviously, oh, that okay. have not, they're not before us, they have not yet been joined, because the district court essentially cut this case off at the knees by ruling that your client could not qualify under the imprisonment factor. That's absolutely right, Your Honor, and I can tell you, and you'll be seeing over the next few months, uh, the AG's office has been very clever about trying to come up with defenses to this statute. So I think we have four cases in total right now in the pipeline that you'll you'll get to decide. So uh, there's other aspects of this statute, clearly, that the state will argue as well. But the I guess my fallback to your argument, though, about which, whether it's summary judgment or motion to dismiss, Your Honor, in my experience, typically a judge will say in their decision whether they're going to treat it as a motion for summary judgment or they're treating it as a motion to dismiss. Nowhere in the judge's order do I recall him ever referencing or saying he's going to treat this as a motion for summary well, judgment. Well, okay, so in the in your petition, you pled that your client was imprisoned. Correct. And so if we were on motion for to dismiss standard, we have to take all well-pled allegations as true. Correct. And so on that standard, you would prevail because you pled that he was imprisoned, right? Correct. Um, to what extent was the court permitted to take into account, for example, the journal entry of sentencing? Was that attached to your petition or is that an additional fact finding. No, that was an additional fact finding, as I recall. So so that has to be a summary judgment, right? Well, I mean, it, that, or, are, or is your argument that this, that the district court improperly, uh, you know, considered facts when it should have just I, denied the motion to dismiss, proceeded to discovery, and then we would have the exact same argument? Well, again, I guess I'd say two things to that. The first off is I think it's a distinction without a meaning because this is clearly a legal issue. So I think the standard of review is going to be the same regardless of whether it was an SJ or a motion to dismiss. However, I guess I would still resist a little bit conceding that it was a motion for summary judgment because, as I said earlier, my experience, courts will usually say which direction they're going to go, and I don't think a district court is required to take some additional evidence to clarify a fact issue and say it's going to treat it as a motion for summary judgment. So, um, I, I, with all due respect, I'm, I'm understand where you're coming from, but I just don't feel like I can go so far as to concede that under this specific situation. Questions? Thank you. Chief Justice, may it please the court. My name is Curtis Wired and I represent the state of Kansas. Your Honors, I want to focus on the discrete legal issue that's before this court today, and that's whether the district court correctly held that the term imprisoned as used in the, the wrongful conviction statute includes time spent in the county jail. We believe that the text of the statute demonstrates that it does not include time in the county jail. It says, is that the right question? Where the defendant physically was? Or, or is or is the question in in what entity's custody was the defendant? I, and the reason I ask this, it it comes right off the top. You know, this first thing that kind of came to mind when I saw this is just knowing as a general practice that sometimes the Department of Corrections will house inmates in county facilities to solve various logistical overcrowding issues or just logistical transport issues. I mean, it, it, is your position really that someone who's serving a sentence with the Department of Corrections who just happens to be housed in a county jail doesn't qualify? I mean, that, that's an ancillary question. I get it. But that was the way you framed your very opening statement raises the, that question again. To me. Yeah, I, I don't know about those specific are those those particular exceptions where they've got. Well, that's what you're arguing. You're, you're, you're saying them. that if you're in the county jail, you can't recover. Well, and here, I'm asking about a hypothetical where 
someone is in that account is clearly serving a prison sentence, but just happens to be housed in a county jail under the auspices of a contractual arrangement or what have you between DOC and a county jail. I mean, I think that would be a very different analysis if you were actually assigned a KDOC number, which Mr. Bumgarner evidently was here, but then you were actually supposed to be shipped to a prison. Well, I, I'm that's, that's very I, different. Than well, that. I guess I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if you, if you really mean what you say when you say if you are physically in the county jail, you cannot recover, or are you making a a slightly narrower argument? No, I, I would say I'm making a narrow argument that that the the use of the term felony crime as used by the legislature connected with subsequently in prison indicates that the legislature was focused on those individuals who would most likely end up in the custody of the secretary of corrections that, that's but, your but argument where, it, sorry chief well where is the word custody uh, there's where is the requirement that there has to be some proof of whose custody this person was in I just don't see that anywhere in the, because you, you said we can look at the plain language of the statute and I don't see custody in, or a question of custody anywhere in the statute. Yes, Your Honor, that, that it's, it's nowhere directly stated in the statute. That's- So we do have to look outside the bounds of the statute, contrary to what you- Well, I, I, think, your... I think if you look at felony crime connected with subsequent imprisonment necessarily implies custody with somebody. And, and in this case, a felony crime means most likely somebody, somebody who's put in the custody of the Secretary of Corrections. But the legislature has directed that for these felony crimes, they can be imprisoned if we would use the broad- common definition that's been presented to us, and that imprisonment can be, for punishment of this felony crime, 60 days in a county jail. So why isn't that enough? That the legislature has spoken that this is a felony, a, a consequence of a felony conviction. It, it is. I, I just, I, I would say that, um, I'm sorry, could you could you rephrase your question? The sentencing statutes set up for this for felonies that some of them will be probation and that a part of that probation can be 60 days in the county jail. So the legislature has defined this as a form of the punishment for a, a felony. And it involves, if we apply a broad, the, a common Black's Law Dictionary of imprisonment, it involves imprisonment in a county jail. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. I, I, Why is that enough? Not enough. So I, I think that there are several answers to that. But if, if we're talking about the plain, ordinary definition of imprisonment, I don't know if the, the dictionary definitions quite get us there. Uh, my friend on the other side talk, uh, talks about the very broad definitions of any restraint on liberty. However, this court's already held in State v. Scherzer that house arrest does not qualify as imprisonment. So, and I, I believe that the court referenced some old attorney general opinions that use that definition of imprisonment. So I, I don't think that uh, broad definite, uh, dictionary definitions can get us quite there. On the, but isn't, but back to my question, I'm focused on what the legislature allowed here. Right. And that was confinement. I mean, jail is not house arrest. Jail is confinement in a prison. It, it, it just not a prison that's under the custody of DOC. It's under a county corrections. What's the difference? I mean, I, I, if the legislature deemed that to be an appropriate place to put a person convicted of a felony. Right. And this, this narrow carve out comes from State v. Walbridge, the court's holding here. The legislature changed the statutory language to provide for the specific sentence that Mr. Baumgartner received. And is it, isn't it important that in that legislative enactment, which is contained in 21-6603G, the legislature chose to describe those 60 days as, quote, imprisonment? Isn't that important here? Are you talking about in 216604, the authorized disposition? Section? No, I'm talking about the definition of probation, which is the specific, I think, the specific subsection under which this defendant was sentenced. This is the, this is the 60 days in county jail. And the statute says that probation is this procedure where a defendant is released by the court without imprisonment, except as provided in felony cases. And then it goes on to say that the court may, as a condition of the probation, orders up to 60 days in county jail. 
And if you read that, those two sentences together, those 60 days in county jail are being described as imprisonment. I, I have here that it says confinement in county jail not to exceed 60 days was the, the statutory fix. I think confinement, just as in the authorized disposition statute in A1 and A3. Where and the, the sentence before that describes that confinement as it says, I mean, it's it's defining it in the negative because right. it's saying without imprisonment, except as provided in felony cases. Sure, I take your meaning. And I think the, the lesson you can draw from this is that the statute's are all over the place. Huff made that point that there are a number of statutes where the, the legislature admittedly has mixed confinement, imprisonment together. So it is difficult. Does that uh, make it ambiguous in this statute? I think it can. It can make it ambiguous in this statute. And this court could turn to Kansas construction to uh, reach a definition. If we were to do that, what's your best argument for the position the state's taken if we were to move on to canons of construction? I, I would start with the legislative history. I think if you look at the legislative history, the 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 proponents of this legislation, the people who drafted it and testified in its favor, were clearly uh, concerned about individuals who had spent years and years, in many cases decades, in prison and then were subsequently exonerated. They weren't concerned about an individual who had spent sixty days in the county jail. Uh, Are you exonerated without a certificate of innocence? I know you asked this of opposing counsel. I'm not entirely certain if there if there's another way to receive a certificate of innocence in the statute. I'm assuming there isn't, but I I, I can't say for certain. Is is this a statutory remedy? <clears throat> the scope of this remedy, uh, it, it can um, a claimant bring an action against a municipality? Specifically, a county. Uh, I have to apologize, Your Honor. I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Um, before we move off of Huff, though, I, I know we, we started talking about uh, ambiguity. I, I do want to point out there, though, that the, the statute at issue in Huff said uh, the language at issue was separate sentences of imprisonment for different crimes. And this court focused on the, the phrase different crimes and said that it clearly includes both felonies and misdemeanors. And I think this is the key statutory language that distinguishes Huff from this case, where the legislature chose to re limit recovery to those individuals who were convicted of a felony and subsequently in prison. So I don't think Huff gets us over the finish line. I don't think the uh, dictionary definitions get us over the line. So it's perfectly reasonable, even before uh, this court were to declare that the language is ambiguous, to look elsewhere in statutes. And we can look in uh, the Kansas Sentencing Guidelines Act. Admittedly, it does state by its own terms that it's limited to its act. But if we're left with a, a term, that, that lacks a definition, it's perfectly appropriate for this court to look at other statutes in par materia with the, this current statute. And their imprisonment is clearly limited to time spent in a KDOC facility. When you're talking about in par materia, um, so we can flip flop from civil to the criminal code. You're saying that's, we have to look at the statutes in par materia from jumping from the civil code to the criminal code? Your Honor, I believe the case law says that if the statutes concern the same subject matter, then the court can uh, compare the two and, and, and use terms. And and you're saying that these do. Well, yes. One is exoneration, as you said, um, and then uh, uh, payment and the certificate. Of the other one is defining it in what context? Uh, what's in, in sentencing, but we're, I mean, we're, we're dealing with an individual whose sentence was later overturned. This, these civil statutes come later in time. However, they're necessarily going to interact in every one of these cases where someone is sentenced and then we have the civil case come up. So yes, I think they concern the same subject matter. You find authority anywhere, not, not even, I, I don't recall anything in Kansas. I made I don't trust my memory though, because uh, but um, I don't recall any in Kansas, and uh, so I'm curious if there's any authority that discusses application of in para materia when you have a statute that you're looking to that excludes that says no, this is a statute that only applies uh, in this limited area. I wasn't able to find a Kansas case, Your Honor. I I. I don't have my brief with me. I did find an out-of-state case, uh, and I, I I believe that the term that they were trying to define was marital status, but I don't remember recall if 
if that term was supposed to be limited to a particular statutory scheme. So I, I am not aware of any. <clears throat> the other uh, point I'd like to make, uh, assuming this court does find that the language is ambiguous, which it, it very well could, is that in in it in in MM, this court already said that it will not read this statute uh, broadly uh, in favor of a claimant that this is not a remedial statute. Uh, rather, I this was not in my brief, but I'd like to add that since this statute represents a waiver, a narrow waiver of the state's sovereign immunity, the court should also narrowly construe the term imprisoned uh, given given this particular circumstance. And I have uh, some U.S. Supreme Court case law. It says waivers of immunity must be construed strictly in favor of the sovereign and not enlarged beyond what the language requires. So I think if you look at the legislative history, you look at uh, uh, you, you take into account the fact that this this involves a waiver of sovereign immunity. Uh, I think the court could find that this that this term is limited to time spent in the custody of the Secretary of Corrections. Um, along those lines, are we? Is it possible we're going about this the wrong way by asking the big picture. We look at the statute and then we say, well, what does this word mean in the statute? Another alternative way of approaching the problem is to simply ask, was this defendant sentenced to imprisonment? Much narrower form of the same kind of question. I suppose you could ask that question. If we ask that question, how, how would you answer that question? I would say that no, he wasn't sentenced to imprisonment. He received an underlying 10 month prison sentence. However, he never went to prison. He was placed in the county jail for 60 days right. but, as well, a condition of probation. That's what happened. But that's but what his sentence was, was he was sentenced to probation with a 60 day jail time as a condition of probation under 6603G. Would you agree with that as a sort of clinically accurate description of the sentence. Yes, that's what his journal entry of judgment states. And we could just ask, well, what is that imprisonment? I, I suppose you could. Um, I, I did want to ask a follow up. I know Justice Wall had asked about uh, whether the KDOC had actually uh, taken custody. I believe below there was an affidavit that was added to the record of an individual from KDOC that confirmed that that Mr. Bungarner was never placed in their custody. Um, unless there are any further questions of the court, I would ask that this court affirm the district court. Yes, you do. Um, sir, shall you reserve three minutes? All we right. don't usually penalize you when we ask the questions that cause you to leave okay. time to go over time. All right. Um, I, what I'd like to do is answer a couple of questions that were asked of uh, my friend uh, from the AG's office. Uh, Justice, while your question about whether an action can br be brought against the county, under this statutory scheme, the only defendant is the state of Kansas. And in fact, the caption isn't even supposed to be uh, against the state of Kansas, it's supposed to be in Ray the wrongful conviction of Damian Baumgartner. Uh, so that's not an available remedy to sue the county under this uh, act. But does that does that inform our interpretation of the statute in in terms of maybe the does that help us at all? Well, yeah, I think it helps. What to, imprisonment means? Well, I think it does because if you could go after the county, that would mean there'd be a separate remedy or a, a separate procedure for that situation. Obviously, the statute applies whichever way you decide it applies to all governmental entities that are involved in incarcerating individuals. And uh, Justice Standridge, I wanted to follow up on your question about exoneration. First off, uh, it is my understanding from my research that this statute is the first time that I've I can find any reference to a certificate of innocence. And I do think that was one of the objectives of this statutory scheme was because even if you're released, you still have that on your record. Uh, 
and it can impact your job and educational opportunities. So I think, and that also, I think it's important to clarify when you talk about exoneration, I hear that word used a lot, but the reality is in our criminal justice system, it's very rare for somebody to truly be exonerated. Many times when cases are dismissed against people, they, the, the prosecutor will just say, well, they've served enough time. We're not going to use our resources to re-prosecute this person or a witness died. So we're not going to re-prosecute this. So even if the case is dismissed, the defendant is not exonerated. Uh, they just are someone who uh, no longer has the threat of trial hanging over their head. The final thing I wanted to say is the legislative history. I would not give much weight to that because obviously the big glaring situation that people think about are the people like my prior client that was in prison for eight years. But that does not mean that the legislature meant to so limit it. If they had intended to limit it to a certain period of time, they would have said that, but they didn't. So I think any amount of imprisonment you're entitled to some remedy, whether it be the certificate of innocence or a pro rata share of the monetary damages. Thank you for your time and questions, and we would respectfully request that you reverse the decision of the Sumner County District Court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel for your arguments. Court will now take this appeal under advisement.